Hello, I'm Sophie Rovner from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this media briefing from ACS Spring 2022. Residential blazes and wildfires take a terrible toll in terms of deaths, injuries, and property loss. Now, researchers are reporting at the ACS meeting on a new type of coating that could limit the flammability of wood used in construction. That could potentially give people more time to escape from fires, and it could also curb the spread of flames. In addition to wood, the environmentally friendly flame retardant could be used for other flammable materials, such as textiles, polyurethane foam, and 3D printed parts. To discuss these findings, we're joined by Dr. Jamie Grunlin from Texas A&M University and Dr. Thomas Kulababa from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks hey, for thanks us. for having us. First, can you tell us what problem you were trying to solve with this research? So other research that we'd done at Texas A&M had shown very effective methods of protecting materials from fire damage using polyelectrolyte treatments, but they required several immersions in different solutions, and one of those solutions couldn't be reused. And so while they were very effective, we felt that limited their commercial application. Uh, by switching to a UV-based uh, approach, we thought that we could cut out one of those steps and make these a more commercially viable system. So how did you investigate this? I'd been doing a lot of reading in photopolymerization literature uh, on the side because it had interested me a lot. And I found a particular monomer called hydroxyethyl methacrylate phosphate that mimicked a lot of the chemistry that we were using in our flame retardant coatings already. And by pairing this with polyethylenimine, which is another chemical we use a lot in these environmentally benign coatings, uh, I figured out a way to leverage some photopolymerization chemistry to cut out what we'd previously needed a buffer curing step for. And what did you find out? We found that we could effectively form the same types of polyelectrolyte complexes that we were forming with our previous approach, but much faster and without a second immersion step. And we think that this technique has applications even beyond just wood and could lead to treatments for textiles, foams, and maybe even intrinsically flame retardant 3D printed parts down the line. So what's the significance of your findings? I think this research can lead to uh, a much more commercially viable use for polyelectrolyte based flame retardant treatments. And I think that that will improve fire safety and the environmental friendliness and just personal safety of these treatments for people who have to be exposed to them in, you know, in home furnishings and in their environment. I'd also add that it's very significant that now you can apply this nitrogen rich molecule with a phosphate rich molecule and with the UV curing step, it's, it's done very quickly, very easily. Everything's done from water. So you also, you're, 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 very effective with the flame retardancy, but you're also very environmentally benign for lack of another word. Uh, so that those two things combined in such an easy, effective way are, makes this very unique compared to competing technologies. So walk me through how you would potentially apply this to some wood for construction. The first step would mimic a lot of our other treatments in that it involves a dipping step. So we would take a piece of wood. We could use commercially available pressure treatment equipment that's used to make wood uh, mold resistant and fungal resistant. And that same infrastructure could be used to first impregnate the wood with our coating solution. And then as it's removed from that, it could be put, you know, exposed to UV light as part of a conveyor belt system or just as it's being transported to the next place in the wood processing facility, wherever that is, the mill, I guess. Um, and that UV exposure step will finish the curing of the coating and trap inside any of the rest of the coating that was pressure treated into the wood and prevent leaching out while imparting that flame retardant effectiveness. And how does the flame retardant work in a fire? The heat of the flame uh, activates what we call an intumescent effect where the phosphate rich materials are beginning to cause the wood or it can be anything really, but in this case, wood uh, starts forming char 
The char helps to protect the underlying wood because it can't combust any further and it blocks the heat from getting further into the wood. Meanwhile, the nitrogen rich component that's mixed in with this degrades and produces a lot of non-flammable gas. That degradation absorbs some of the heat energy from the fire uh, and also the non-flammable gas chokes out the oxygen supply to the fire. And so all of these things combine at once uh, to create what's, what's called an intumescent shell around the interior of the wood and protects you know, degradation beyond the surface layer. It's, yeah, it's important to note that the gas that's being released actually causes the char to have a bubbled quality to it that tends to thicken up that char and makes it more effective than just char by itself. Everything that burns or not, a lot of things that burn form a char, but it doesn't have this bubbled effect. And these bubbles kind of thicken up the char and insulate even more effectively than what you would call traditional char. So we've talked about potential industrial applications, but you also think that um, individuals might be able to use this kind of treatment. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, my, my real hope with this technology is that it could be a bridge towards developing something that could be distributed to, to property owners and end users where you know, they can take the same kind of backpack sprayer that you'd use to spray you know, an, an, a protective oil or you know, herbicides or pesticides on your property. A lot of people have those backpack sprayers already and use them for things around their house. If you could load a solution of our chemical or our treatment into that and then cure it either with a handheld UV lamp or, or maybe even potentially just from the ultraviolet rays of the sun, you could protect the, your fences, your outbuildings, you know, at your house even, uh, from the potential dangers of a wildfire. I think that's a really exciting potential application of this work. How much might this cost compared to other currently available flame retardant coatings? I, I think I think these are similar cost or could possibly be even lower cost. None of the ingredients that we're using are exotic. Uh, they are they can be purchased uh, if not off the shelf, they can be purchased from companies who mass produce them. So it's not, if the, they may not be commodity, but they're not specialty either. So, so I think the cost is not going to be a big issue. And what's the next step in this research? We're trying to work with different um, industrial partners. We're also working with governmental partners of various types uh, to further develop this to a commercial uh, final use. Uh, and so it, there's, there's three or four or five different directions going on simultaneously at the, at the present time. What do you want viewers to take away from your talk? What's the key conclusion or message? I think that I think the biggest thing is so there's a lot of fear around flame retardancy because in the old days, or and not just the old days, currently people are working with some toxic ingredients in some commercial flame retardants. I don't want to cast too broad of a net, but there's a lot of concern about toxicity with flame retardancy. And here we're providing an environmentally benign, but equally or even more effective flame retardant treatment. So this is the, I think the biggest thing from this work. Thank you, Jamie and Tom for sharing your research with us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Be sure to check out our other media briefings for ACS Spring 2022, which will be posted throughout the meeting at www.acs.org slash ACS Spring 2022 briefing.